We're in a series on, in the book of Ruth, and um, uh, this is part eight. Uh, and today I want to talk about great legacy. If you're new to new life, you're coming to the end, like the end, the end of the movie. But uh, I believe you're still going to be blessed today because every message, uh, uh, Holy Spirit has a way of speaking to us. Doesn't matter where we are in our life, on what lap we are in life. If you're new, the book of Ruth starts with a famine and three funerals. This book starts with a lot of weeping, pain and sorrow. And uh, it ends a totally different way. This book ends with wedding, baby, and a great legacy. In our life, Christian or not, you will experience seasons of darkness, seasons of the night. But how many of you know the Word of God says that joy comes in the morning? Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So if you are going through the season of weeping, it's just a season. If you're going through emotional season of weeping, it's just a season. Keep going somebody said if you're going through the valley of the shadow of death keep going don't stop there don't put a tent there keep going because God has a season of celebration and joy is in your future lots of weeping lots of stress lots of anxiety poverty in the beginning of this book famine sorrow pain and Today, there is a wedding, baby, and a grand, great legacy. One of the major running themes running through the book of Ruth is the providence of God. Providence is an invisible hand of God working behind the scenes in all of our lives. See, sometimes we say, God, where is your miraculous? I want to see healing. I want to see demons coming out. I want to see raising of the dead, Pastor. And uh, a lot of times what we don't see, because in this book of Ruth, we don't see any miracles. But it's in the Bible, so it's miraculous. And, it, and when you look at the book backwards, from the back, from the, from the end of the story, you see God's hand is on this family, on these people. And He's working things out. There will be a party in your future. God is going to make sure of it. God is going to, maybe you've been mistreated. Maybe you've been abandoned. Maybe you've been dumped. Maybe you have some, uh, your spouse left you. Maybe all these bad things happened to you. Maybe you've been through bankruptcy. God is not done with you yet. If you're alive, God is not finished with you yet. Oh, and that's good news. Come on, somebody. Let's, let's give God the glory in this place. Now, last week, we talked about how Boaz went to court, right? Business court or real estate court. And um, there was a guy who was his relative who was supposed to marry Ruth, but he didn't want to. He abandoned that responsibility. And so Boaz is now saying, I will redeem this woman. Okay? Now, Let's open our Bible today to um, Ruth chapter 4. And we're going to read from verse 9. And then we'll just stop whenever. Um, And here's what it says. Then Boaz said to the elders and to the crowd standing around, You are all witnesses that today I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Mahlon. And with the land I have acquired... Ruth the Moabite, widow of Mohlan, to be my wife. This way she can have a son. Notice this. This way she can have a son. Not I will have a son. This way she can have a son to carry on the family name for her dead husband. Men don't talk like that. We want a son for ourselves to carry our 
name and our legacy. Right, guys? Notice what Boaz says. This is Boaz saying, This way she can have a son to carry on the family name of her dead husband and to inherit the family property here in his hometown. So not just legacy, but inherit the property. Meaning he's working for somebody else now. Wow. Then the elders and all the people standing in the gates replied, We are witnesses. So they're putting their stamp on it. You know, notarizing it. We're witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel. Like Leah from whom all the nations of Israel's, Israel descended. May you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Wow, what a blessing. Let's keep going. And may the Lord give your descendants by this young woman. Notice she's a young woman. He's an older man uh, who will be like those of our ancestor Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah. So both took Ruth into his home and she became his wife. Meaning they slept together. They had a, notice there wasn't a huge engagement in this, in this story. You know, we like to drag when people come to me and say, Pastor, we're getting married. When? They're like 2022 September. 2022. And here's what I've seen. It, they never make it. That's why they're setting that so far. So they don't. It's like an alcoholic. Goes and hides a bottle of whiskey at his job site where he knows he's going to be, you know, it's planning. Your, mine is, the, your, the human heart is very deceitful. I had employees who would go and hide bottles of booze. They would ask me, where are we working next uh, tomorrow? And they would go and hide booze there. <laughs> and I'd be like, how? Why would you do that? <laughs> the, the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Anyway, that's not my message. Just, I don't know. I had to get it out. <laughs> So Boaz took Ruth home into, into his home. And she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her, like on the first night, wow, uh, to become pregnant. And she gave birth to a son. This barren woman, remember, that's her first, second marriage. That's her second marriage. Maybe his first, but hers for sure second. And she gave birth to a son. Let's keep going. Then the women of the town said to Naomi, that's the bitter old mother-in-law, Praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child, what is this thing? Be famous. Why are they talking about being famous in Israel? They said, Boaz, be famous in Israel. Now this child may be famous in Israel. They're talking prophetically. They're talking about the, the most famous person in the world. Come on, give, can I give you a little secret? Don't tell this to anybody. Jesus. They don't know him. This is a, hundred, a thousand years uh, before, maybe more than a thousand years before he was born. But they're prophesying. Their prayer has prophecy in it. May this child be famous in Israel. Let's keep going. This is awesome. May he restore your youth and care for you. See, the Bible says that grandchildren restore the youth of the grandparents. Right? It's good for them. That's what grandparents keep telling me. They love kids. They get the best of our kids without all their responsibility. You know, when a child, uh, when, when a grandkid poops in his uh, diaper, the grandparents are like, oh, that's parents' responsibility. We just, we just feed them ice cream and, and whatever they want, candy. And then they come home and they can't sleep at night because they have tummy aches. That's, that's grandparents for you. They get all the fun. They get to do over, uh, except this time they do it right. <laughs> they spoil the kids. <laughs> May he restore your youth. Grandchildren, restore the youth. Children, restore the youth. And care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. In Israel, let's just quick, quick detour. In Israel, to have seven sons was like perfection. Like God's hand is upon this uh, family. You know, I come from a family of seven sons. 
I can testify. <laughs> so is my brother Eli, the one who led worship today. He's the youngest. I'm the oldest. God is good. Anyway, I mean, he's, but look what, what people are saying in that community. The Ruth, the one you said is nothing to me. Remember when in chapter 1, when Naomi came home from Moab to Bethlehem, she complained to the people. She said, the Lord has been really bad to me. The Lord has been bad to me. Here's what he did. I have went away full and came back empty. And here's Ruth standing next to Naomi. What about me? What about me? I love you. That's not empty. See, the people that we put down sometimes in our life are the ones who ended up being the most loyal. The people that we don't think of much of, God will show in the end that they are the most loyal and the most faithful people who ever were. Look what, look what the people are saying. You, you said that you came home empty. But this daughter-in-law who loves you, that's not empty. When somebody loves you, that's not empty. She has been, oh, this is so beautiful, better to you than seven sons. Wow. God is showing off here in His providence, doesn't He? God is showing off. And, and listen, God is no respecter of man. What he did for Ruth and Naomi, he's doing in our life. Just be patient. Just wait. Just don't give up on him. He's not finished yet. It's a long process. It's not like, see, a lot of people want to come to church and, and think like in three months, God will, uh, like a, if you play a country song backwards thing. God will restore your marriage. God will restore your dog and, and your bank account and you get your house back, you know. That's not how it works. God is a generational God. He takes, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't rush. How I know He doesn't rush? Jesus says, I'm going to go back to the Father and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. They had to wait 10 days. He doesn't, he's not rushing. He's, he's, he's got everything under control. I love this. For he's the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons, than perfection. Seven is the number of perfection. Seven sons is a, uh, the perfection of blessing. I, I, I need to show my mom and dad this verse because <laughs> I'm sure when we were growing up, they didn't feel like we were perfection. <laughs> I'm going to show my mom that. All right. Next verse. Come on. Uh, Naomi took the baby, and that's the older woman bitter. She's not bitter anymore. Weeping endures in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Watch this. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast, and she cared for him as if he were her own. Some rabbis said that she began to breastfeed him. <laughs> I don't know how that works. We're going to leave that alone, but <laughs> the neighbor women said, now at last Naomi has a son again, and they name him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and grandfather of David. Who do you think is writing this story? David. Or at least he hires somebody to run this story. Because this story ends with David. David had a grandpa. How many of you heard stories from your grandpa? I still remember stories my grandpa told me and, 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 and the lessons that he was teaching me. Both of my grandpas. David had a grandpa. He was the son of Boaz and Ruth. And grandpa told this story to King David when he was growing up. And King David either wrote that himself or had somebody else in his kingdom write this story. Because this story ends with David. If it was written during the time of Ruth, that would be an addition then. You can't do that. You can't add to somebody else's book. No. Uh, people do revise books today. But, uh, but this is the Bible. So this was written in David. Uh, let's, uh, let's keep going. This is genealogical record of 
their ancestor Perez. Perez was the father of Hazron. Hazron was the father of Ram. Oh, that's a cool name. Some of you maybe could name your kid Ram. <laughs> it's biblical. Ram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nachshon. Nachshon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz. You know who Boaz's mother was? Rahab, the prostitute. The one who put a red scarlet thread on the wall of Jericho. And her family was saved when Israel walked around Jericho seven times. That was Boaz's mother. See, sometimes genealogy is like reading a phone book in a Bible. But when you study the Bible, it all makes sense. There's a connecting line through all of it. Solomon was the father of Boaz. Boaz was the father of Obed. That's it. That's how the story ends. I think that would be enough today. But I still want to talk to you about legacy. Uh, there is a price to pay for a great legacy. I don't know if anybody here read, I'm sure you did, the book called Seven Habits of Highly Successful People by Stephen Covey. How many of you read that book? Thank you. Awesome book, right? Um, one of the assignments he gives to people, he says, if you want to know what to live for, like what's the purpose, what's most important in my life, he says, you got to live your life backwards. So he says this, do this exercise. And I think this exercise would be good for all Christians to do, all of you here to do today. He says, take a piece of paper and imagine yourself at your own funeral. You're dead. You're dead. So I don't know how you can imagine that. But now imagine who do you want to be there? He says, those are the most important people in your life and the people you want to invest in in your life what do you want them to say about you imagine you're laying in that casket there's people around you weeping what would you want them to say about you he was rich and greedy he was famous and a jerk All she cared was herself. She was mean. What do you want people to say about you? She was selfless. He was selfless. He was kind and loving. She invested into others. She was generous. He was... Come on, throw some things you would want people to say about you. Come on. Patient, Thank you. Oh, Jesus. You had to bring that up, didn't you? <laughs> what else? Come on. Uh. What? God-fearing. Peaceable. Full of peace. Yeah. Kind. That's huge, right? This person was kind. Notice all these things you are saying is not valued really much in our life. We want to make as much money as we can. We want to live for ourselves. As We don't say that, but we do live for ourselves. It's all about me. It's all about what I can get. It's all about how much of this piece of American dream pie I can get for myself. That's what we live for. We waste time worrying about people that we wouldn't care if they were at our funeral or not. And we abandon the closest family members, close friends. We, we worry about what people we don't care about think about us. We spend sleepless nights doing that. And we rob the people that are most important in our life, like our spouses. Nobody will care how much you worked 60 hour a week, weeks in your life. Nobody will care how much money you have in your bank account. They will care what kind of person and how much you invested into them. And so Stephen Covey said, write that down and then live just for that. Live just for that. When I did that exercise, I realized my life changed. 
because I realized I'm worrying about things. I am investing into things that don't matter. Well, I got to invest into my family. I, I want to do as much for the kingdom of God because one of the things I would like in my funeral that this guy brought thousands of people closer to Jesus. God used him to bring thousands of people closer to Jesus. Hallelujah. And so to have a great legacy, uh, Boaz does something. Turn verse 9, please. Verse 9. It says, then Boaz said to the elders and crowd, and the crowd standing around, you are witnesses today that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Mohlan. Verse 10, watch this. And with the land I have acquired Ruth, the Moabite widow of Mahlon, to be my wife. This way she can have a son to carry on the family name for her dead husband. And to inherit the family property here in his hometown. You are all witnesses. So here's the thing. I see about good man. And man, this is something we should look up to. Don't look up to cool man don't look up to smooth man look up to these kind of man notice what he does he is not benefiting a lot from this transaction he is buying out so redeeming means something like this a while back uh, somebody stole the, a lot of important tools from our business in the morning when we came all of the toolboxes in our trucks were open and all of the most expensive tools we're gone. We can't work that day, right? Because the tools are gone. Suddenly, uh, I'm praying. I'm, Lord, Lord you, who did it? I don't know. You know, help me out. Help me find them. I, I can't afford new tools. Suddenly, I get a phone call. Tip. It's that guy who works for you did it. And he wasn't there that day. <laughs> Didn't show up that day. All right. So uh, they told me what pawn shop they took the... Um, the tools so I called the pawn shop and I say hey did you get these kind of tools you know yesterday they're like yeah yeah we we got it from this guy and they named his name I now I remembered his name pastor Anthony I'm not gonna say it he's in prison right now so I didn't put him there but he he did something else and and got himself into uh, and so I go to this pawn shop and I'm like can I have my tools please they're like did you do a police report yeah of course uh, can I have my tools they're like no you gotta pay for it you got to redeem it. It's my tools. They were stolen from me. Doesn't matter. We paid them, you know, $250 or $350. I don't remember anymore how much. You got to pay us. And then when you figure it out, if, if the court can get money from him, then we will get that money and then we will give you your money back. Guess what? It's been like 10 years. I've never got my money back. Ever. All right. And I don't expect to, but... Notice what Boaz does. This property he's buying out, it's not going to be his. He's using his money to invest. This boy that he's going to have and raise is not going to be his. This field that he's going to plow with his sweat and hard labor, it's not going to be his. Put that verse uh, 10. I, I just want it to be there. It's going to be all to this boy named Obed. It's all going to be his. Obed. Why is he doing this, guys? Because it's the right thing to do. Sometimes you got to do what's not profitable to you. And... Uh, there's a price for a legacy. There's a price. Moms, our cultures mock mothers who decide to quit their jobs and take care of their children and invest into the next generation. I say, you moms are legacy makers. You're making a sacrifice. You are legacy makers. So many people in our church today, right now, sacrifice time to serve in kids church so there could be peace 
in the service, right? So you don't get frustrated and walk out. <laughs> There's so many people volunteer in, in many departments. There's security people outside the, uh, watching us, hopefully, in the lobby. <laughs> and making sure that we are safe here and our kids are safe. Amen? Uh, so many people who are reaching out to this community, inviting their friends and family so they can encounter this Jesus Christ that changed our life. You are a legacy maker. Fathers, maybe you sacrifice, you know, a certain move and maybe you can get a better job, but you choose to have this job so your kids can go to school and so they can have a safe environment, so they can have good friends, right? You are a legacy maker. Did you know that selfless acts of kindness usually outlive us? Selfless acts of kindness may not always be rewarded in your lifetime. The selfless acts of kindness may not always be rewarded in your lifetime. Actually, most likely they will be rewarded in your future. And that's why I think Paul says, do not go weary Grow weary doing good because you will reap a harvest if you do not faint. And I don't know if Boaz is reaping a great harvest in his lifetime. He's a father. He's an older guy, so he takes, it takes more energy for everything. He's tilling this field. He's taking care of the horses and donkeys and sheep for somebody else. And I'm sure a thought runs through his head. Why am I doing this? Why? It's not even going to be my child. This child is going to have somebody else's last name. Why am I doing this? Ever done the work for God? Volunteers? Servants? Ever done something and saying, why am I doing this? Does this even matter? Yes, it does. You might not get rewarded in this lifetime, but God said it that way that you could be rewarded for eternity. Here's... Here's what Jesus said to Pharisees. You pray so you get your reward and praise in this lifetime. That's all the reward you're going to get. But it's so little and so nothing. But when you pray in secret, when you do things, generosity in secret, God says, I will reward you for everybody to see. And that doesn't mean just your small community, but for eternity to see. Man, that's a different type of living, guys. And some of you are like, why should I serve? Uh, we have Nathan here. He um, fills this baptistry all the time. And then he, you know, sucks it all out. We have this pump because some people, people always ask me, how do you get the water out? How do you get the water out? Well, we have this pump you have in your home in the basement. We have a hose to it. And then in the back we have this hole, you know, drain hole. And that you have to suck it out. It takes a lot of work. And he does it every time. Every other month we have a baptism. Why is he doing that? Because all those eight people who got baptized last week, that's his reward. That goes to his bank account in heaven. Legacy. Legacy. And here's why we sometimes get weary. Because we don't think that what we do for God matters. But listen to me. Everything we do on this earth will rot, rust, die. Everything. Your boat will get old. Your car will get old. But everything you do for God matters for eternity. When we bring just one soul, soul, it's not me bringing them to Jesus. It's you bringing them closer to Jesus. When you bring a friend and they get saved, that affects eternity. And how do you know how many people this person will affect? Only heaven will know. But I just want to tell you from the Spirit of God, don't get weary. I know sometimes I get weary. Sometimes you're like, God, and it's a small problem, right? When you're tired, the devil attacks you with a small thought. And it's like, is it even worth it? Or should I quit and go fishing like Peter says? You know, I'm done with ministry. I'm going fishing. I'm going to business. I'm going to work. And God says, no, 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 no. There's a reward. Don't get weary. 
selfless acts of kindness may not be rewarded in your lifetime because God wants to reward you for eternity. Boaz, I don't know if he got rewarded. Yeah, he lived a regular life. But the legacy that he left. Did you know that when Solomon was building a temple, one of the pillars in that temple of God, which was the most expensive, the most beautiful building where God himself dwelt, was named after Boaz. You know what Boaz means? Strong. Boaz had no way of knowing that was going to happen. In the New Testament, book of Matthew, first chapter, there's genealogy. Guess who shows up? Boaz. Not Mahlon. <laughs> he was thinking he was building a name for somebody else. <laughs> he was thinking he was helping somebody else's business and he was just assisting. But God canceled out, crossed out the name of Mahlon in the New Testament and guess who shows up? Don't, go weir don't grow weary in doing good. Only God knows what's going to happen in three, four generations. We serve a God of generation. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moms, keep, keep pouring in into your children. Keep praying for your children. Don't give up on your children. Keep, keep doing it. Fathers, stick in there. Right? Stick around. Don't, don't, don't give up. And don't just say, ah, oh, you know, it's hard. She's all into the children. I, I don't, I, they don't even need me here. No, they do. They do. Don't grow weary. Come on. Imagine a boat on an ocean. When we do a selfless act of kindness, this is how I see it in the spirit. We are getting, our boat gets realigned into our destiny. Whenever we do selfish acts, and we're all selfish, so don't, don't feel bad. Whenever we do selfish act, it's like we are a boat who uh, lost control of the wheel and it just goes in circles. How many of you played Mario Brothers uh, video game when you were growing up? Isn't it awesome? We just bought it, and it's not the same. I'm telling you, the, the pixels, it's horrible. I'm like, we played that? <laughs> the quality of the picture? Oh, just, pff, I can't, I can't, I, I can't. But then it was so cool. But here's the thing about Mario Brothers. When you go, there's a level. And if you don't pass the level, what happens? you go back if you don't pass the level you go back same thing happens with our life there's levels and God says if you're selfish you're going back to do this class again and again and again and you're like frustrated I've been here before God and God says stop being selfish <laughs> learn what I want you to learn from this wow Selfless acts of kindness may not be rewarded in your lifetime because God wants to reward you for all eternity. Come on. Can you guys handle another point? Yes. Yeah, okay. What is this prayers that they're praying in court? Look at verse 11 with me. Prophetic prayers of the people. Then the elders and all the people standing at, in the gate, that's where the court is happening, replied, we are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and like Leah. Why are they saying this about Moabite? Illegal alien. Well, legal maybe now, but she's marrying a, a legal guy. So <laughs> why are they <laughs> talking like that about her? They're, they're saying, may you be like Rachel and Leah. Who are Rachel and Leah? They're the mothers of Israel. Rachel and Leah had 12 sons. 
And that's how 12 tribes or 12 state of Israels were formed. They are a big deal. In the history of Israel, Rachel and Leah, and look what they're saying. May the Lord make this foreign woman who used to worship pagan gods, whose people are the byproduct of incest. May she be like Rachel and Leah. What is God doing? Religious people don't want to talk about this part. Because genealogy of Jesus has some interesting women in it. Who was Boaz's mother? The prostitute. Who was Obed's mother? Ruth, the Moabite, the pagan worshiper who became a believer. And now they're saying, may you be like Rachel and Leah from whom all nation of Israel descended. And here's what I believe here. I think they're speaking prophetically here. They don't know what they're saying. But they're saying that you will become a mother of a famous, famous, famous person. And that's why you will always be famous and your name will live in history forever. Because through your lineage, because through your obedience... Because you abandoned your false gods and followed a poor, bitter woman named Naomi into Israel and trusted a God who couldn't even save her own sons. You trust that your name will be famous. May you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem, verse, next verse, next verse, 12. May the Lord give you descendants by this young woman. Now this, they're talking, prophesying into Boaz. May the Lord give you descendants by this young woman who will be like those of our ancestor Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah. Okay, in the verse 13. That's, no, that's it, that's it. So I see three prophetic prayers. And I think, first prayer, Ruth became like Rachel and Leah, who were the founding mothers of the tribe of Israel. Ruth is no longer a Moabite, but in every way an Israelite, she has full status now. Second prayer is for Boaz. They're praying for him to continue to prosper, and they're calling him to be famous in Israel. Why are they calling him to be famous? What is, what is it about fame here? Obviously, his great great grandson will be, well, King David, Solomon, and then Jesus. That's famous. Why do people want to be famous? We all want to be. Come on. Somewhat, no? No? You don't want to be? Okay. Well, you're. I thought you all did, but. <laughs> Have you ever pl played uh, guitar uh, here? Hero? Come on. What, what's that all about? Ah, okay. You're not as good as you thought you were. <laughs> Woo! We want to be famous, number one, because we want to be known. Everybody, we don't want to be lonely and alone and nobody knows us. We want to, we feel like if we're famous, we'll have so many friends, but that's a lie. But, if, uh, but every human being has desire to be famous because we're all called to live forever. And what we do in life matters. That's our history. That's our, not biography. Because biography, look what I've done. But testimony. In heaven, you will have your testimony. You know you'll be famous in heaven. People will want to know your story. And um, the people who had the best life on the earth, their stories will be the most boring stories. <laughs> and people who went through some stuff, their stories will show the grace, mercy, and glory of God. 
What is Paul says? Um, these temporary trials produce what in us? Great glory. The path of the righteous is never a straight path to glory. But God is faithful and he will make sure that they get there in due season. <laughs> so that's what they're saying. May your name be known. May your story be known. And then uh, they're saying, uh, they're bringing this Tamar and Judah. Tamar was also barren. She couldn't have children either. Remember, this? Uh, it's a long story. It's kind of a bad story too. <laughs> but, but may you be like Tamar, uh, who is the mother of Perez, which means praise. And uh, may you have lots of children. May you have children. And so... Selfless people, selfless people bring the blessing of God upon their own heads. And selfish, greedy people bring the curse upon their own head. Selfless people bring the blessing of God upon their own heads. And then we see, and I'm done. I'm one minute over, so let me just be quick. They get married. They go on honeymoon, and she conceives, and she has a baby. I'm sure she's relieved. He's relieved now. They're all celebrating. But now Naomi, the old bitter woman, is no longer bitter. Listen, if you feel like an old bitter woman, if you feel like an old bitter man because life has been hard to you maybe you've been divorced maybe you've been abandoned maybe you've life has just been hard a Ruth story is your story thank you oh <laughs> fool me once You know what Pastor Van did to me yesterday? You've seen it on Instagram. That stinker. And he and he had he pranked me. That guy is a prankster. But they told me about at his work. That's what they called him a prankster. So anyway, see it on Instagram. Um, God uses shady people in the lineage of a perfect Jesus Christ. Boaz, mother, was Rahab, the prostitute. Ruth was Moabite from pagan people. David has a son with who? Who becomes kings? King Solomon with Bathsheba. You know what they did? <laughs> Nothing to brag about. That's all in the lineage of Jesus. Then Mary comes to the New Testament. And what do they call her? Although she's not that, but she has a bad reputation. When I was growing up, I was made to believe that all these people in the Bible are perfect and can do no wrong. But the more I study the Bible, the more I know how much I don't know God and I want to know Him more. And how, how much He uses shady people to accomplish His purposes. Former shady people, let me just say that. <laughs> to accomplish His purposes. Listen to me. If God was looking for perfect people, He couldn't use anybody. And that's why He's using me. And that's why he's using you. And maybe today you're thinking, well, uh, if I could get better, if I could stop smoking or drinking, then I'll, God can use me. I would say, make a commitment. God, use me today. And change me in the process. Change me in the process. What a gracious God that we serve. 
I praise God today for the Savior who welcomes shady people to himself. If you are a follower of God, I'm going to end with this. Remember, God writes the final chapter. God writes the final chapter. Thanks for tuning in to New Life Sermon Series Online. If you're blessed by these messages and are interested in helping spread the word of God to others, make an investment today. You can give at newlifechurchsf.org. If you have a story or a testimony to share, let us know on our website as well. We hope you have a blessed day and enjoy today's message by Pastor Alex.